Israel. Good afternoon from another country, which we'll talk about in a minute. I just want to introduce myself to anyone who doesn't know me. My name is Dr. Tova Goldfein. We are streaming live from Israel today. Um, I'm a doctor, a chiropractor, a passionate about helping mind, body, healing, um, a specialist with tension myonora syndrome, Dr. Sarno's work, certified with pain reprocessing therapy, helping people help themselves every day, um, day by day, along with my co-host and professional partner, Rose Hui, who's this amazing woman. She'll tell you a little bit about herself, though she's kind of shy. If she doesn't tell you, I will. But good morning. Good afternoon, Rose. <laughs> Hi, Tova. Good morning, Paul, or good evening, afternoon, Paul. Yeah. Uh, Paul's in Australia. He's at Monash University, and he's um, a bioethicist. He's also on a journey, like most of you people. He was a bike rider. And he couldn't ride his bike. So he did some research. Now, what he's done is he's written a book that's very readable. Where is it? There you go. It's, it's technical and readable. And anyone who actually wants to read a book that's easy to read, open, and gets the idea that, um, how would I put it, that, that they want to recognise that they have got somatic pain and that it's coming from a broken heart rather than a broken leg, so to speak. Uh, so, Paul, would you please... Oh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, Paul's a doctor of medicine. Now, the thing is that he was 20 years in the emergency department at Monash Hospital. Now, on a day-to-day -day basis, he would have seen patients coming in with severe migraines, severe back pain, crippling back pain, and all the rest, inflammatory gut, all those things in the ED department. But of course, he had no way of fixing it besides giving them some narcotics or whatever. So his journey has been about wanting to know more. And he's taken on board the, the uh, journalist side of him and the doctor side of him, and I guess the bioethicist side of him, and put it all together in an amazing book. And when I read it originally, I thought, wow, all the books that are available are good. There's no, I'm not saying any of them aren't good. But what I am saying is that Paul's written a book that someone who has somatic pain, who has chronic pain and can't focus, will be able to read this book. So thank you so much for, uh, for publishing it. So would you mind sort of giving us a bit of a bio of your background? and how you became interested, especially the bike riding. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Look, thanks so much for having me on the show, Rose and Tova. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, I started life as a, a doctor. Uh, I worked as a doctor for 20 years, the last decade as an emergency medicine specialist in, in Melbourne. Um, but I, I gave up medicine and, and moved into academia and, and uh, became a bioethicist at Monash University. I did a master's, a PhD and, and a postdoc in various subjects uh, surrounding bioethics. And in the last eight, nine years, I've transitioned again um, to become a science journalist. And you know, I've written a lot of articles for various newspapers in Australia, The Age, the Sydney Morning Herald, Cosmos Magazine. Uh, and I thought, you know, maybe it's time to write a book about pain. And the thing that triggered this was that at the age of 47, perhaps unwisely, um, I decided I'd take up push bike racing and so I took it up and really enjoyed it and thought I'd better do some sprint training. So while I was riding to the Queen Victoria Market in Melbourne, where I used to do the shopping and bring all the shopping back on, on my bike, my push bike in a couple of panniers, sometimes up to 25 kilos, I thought I'd do some sprint training. I was pushing really hard. Surprise, surprise, I gave myself a case of chronic pain above my left knee, a condition called patellofemoral pain syndrome. And look, I went to see a sports and exercise physician, a guy called Cal Freed, lovely guy, features in the book. Um, and I had the pain for about three or four months at this stage. And Cal said to me, you know, Paul, now the pain's officially chronic because it's lasted longer than about 10 weeks. And he said, have you heard of this thing called neuroplasticity? And this is about 2010. I hadn't really uh, heard of it. I hadn't read Norman Deutsch's book on neuroplasticity then. Uh, and I said, no, and he explained to me that what can happen in the setting of, of chronic pain, where you've got an, a, a chronic injury, 
is that that painful stimulus can cause the sensory nerves um, leading down from me, in my case, to the knee, in the spinal cord, and, and, and even areas of the brain to become sensitized to pain. Um, and this is a process called central sensitization. Neuroplasticity is pushing that along by causing changes in the synapses or the connections between, between the neurons uh, and strengthening those connections. So why does this happen? It actually happens very early on in an acute injury that we develop central sensitization. Um, it happens because the body has got this kind of better safe than sorry agenda. It wants you to stop doing everything and get help. So what it does is through that sensitization of the sensory pathways, um, it causes things that didn't actually hurt that much before to hurt a lot more. And it also causes things that wouldn't normally hurt at all um, to hurt. And in my case, that thing was the wind blowing on my knee as I, as I rode the bike. It was a really interesting discovery because what it suggests is that if you've got central sensitization as a significant contributor to your pain, um, what, we, what we know now is that it's very likely that the anatomical part, whether it be the knee, uh, the lower back, the shoulder, wherever that pain was originally coming from, it's very likely that that area has now healed or at least it's no longer the source of the pain and the pain is now coming from the sensitized sensory nerves mm -hmm. and changes in the brain. And there is a very, very important corollary of that observation. And, and that is that um, in my case, if you've got central sensitization causing you to feel pain in the knee and it is 100% real, it really hurts, it may not be appropriate to have treatments that are anatomically targeted at the knee. For example, injections to the knee in someone with osteoarthritis, maybe it's not appropriate to have um, knee surgery at that point in time if central sensitization is a big contributor to pain. Um, so it was a really, a really enlightening process for me and I actually got better by doing graded exercise. So I basically just got on the bicycle in, in the garage. I had a stationary trainer and I rode for 30 seconds one night following Cal's um, instructions, waited two days, didn't get any pain. On the record, <laughs> on the record, it was not unwise for you to take up biking at 47. Just on the record, it was exactly what your body needed to do. You needed to balance out your right, your left brain with some right brain exercise and fun because you were, you know, and it was actually not an unwise thing just to, you know, set the record straight. Story. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's, that's a fair fair point, um, and. You, you know, this, this process really um, educated me about the nature of pain, such that um, about six or seven years later, I developed another pain. I don't want to go on about my knees and my, my pain, but I had pain in my right knee. This time it was formally diagnosed with an MRI as a, as a torn meniscus. So these are the little shock absorbing cartilages in, in the knee joint that sit between the thigh bone, the femur, and the leg bone, the tibia in, in the knee joint. Um, and so I tore that and got an MRI. It was uh, confirmed that. And, and I spoke to a colleague of mine who's a really wonderful guy, orthopedic surgeon. He said, yeah, Paul, we'll, we can do a trim on that for you and that should improve things. And in fact, he had had this surgery himself. Um, but I didn't have private health insurance. So I was on the public health waiting list. And about six or eight weeks elapsed and I still hadn't been booked in for surgery. And I started looking at some of the literature and thinking, well, actually, I wonder whether central sensitization is contributing to my pain here because there were some studies coming out that were showing that in fact, getting surgery to, to the knee, if you've got a torn meniscus, in this case, a degenerative tear, a tear that happens as you get older, I'm, I'm 60 years old now, um, is no better than actually having fake surgery. So we now got a bunch of trials that are comparing actual surgery to placebo surgery to see if that final critical surgical, surgical element is actually making a difference here, trimming the meniscus. And I looked at this, the studies, I went and saw Cal Fred again, and I made a decision, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna delay this surgery because I really think now that central sensitization could be causing some of this pain and I'm not sure that this surgery is gonna help. So I actually put off the surgery, this is 2019, and I ne never had it. So the other thing that happened was after, about a year or so after this, I thought, this central sensitization thing is really amazing because it can, as I mentioned, it can keep on uh, in giving you this pain. When can you explain it again? Your... Just like because there's some listeners, if you can explain it, it's a very important word and it's a, it's a layman's term. 
that we can all understand. If you could explain it again, please. Mm. So this central sensitization, um, whereby the nerves, the things that generate all the sensations that um, pass up from, in this, in this case, the knee, go into the spinal cord, up the spinal cord to the brain, to a part of the brain called the sensory cortex, uh, those nerves become sensitized. Uh, and they generate pain in and of themselves, even if the part that you're feeling the pain in has healed. So it's it's a very robust phenomenon. It was why is it doing by- that? Why is it doing that? And it is doing that probably because of the body having a, a kind of overprotective helicopter parent approach. Right. To- fight, fight, flight, fight, fight, flight, fight, flight, and like I'm going to protect you just because you, you're anxious or because you have some stress because your unconscious mind's giving me a little bit of a something might be wrong not necessarily it's doing it because it wants you to 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 get the message loud and clear that you shouldn't move on this and so it starts very early on immediately after an injury but in some people in a lot of people the the sensitization damps down it goes away and it heals normally Uh, and they're not left with chronic pain but in a certain percentage that central sensitization continues um, and that those people are left with chronic pain. Uh, and we know that if central sensitization is a big contributor to your pain, let's say it's coming from your knee and you've got osteoarthritis in the knee, you know, bone on bone in the x-ray and all those changes that, that many people will be familiar with in the knee as they get older. Um, a recent study came out last year that measured uh, central sensitization in people who were um, due to have knee replacement surgery those people did significantly worse after the surgery. Why? Because the knee isn't causing the pain or it's not the predominant cause of the pain. It's the sensory nerves. So when you understand that, look, it's not just me saying this. I mean, in in this book, I interviewed two dozen of the world's leading pain researchers. I interviewed Clifford Wolf, Professor Clifford Wolf at Harvard Medical School. He discovered central sensitization. And I did a search on Amazon. Surely someone's interviewed Cliff about, central sensitization and the staggering landmark discovery, which I believe is the most important study in 20th century pain science. It hadn't been written up in a book. And I thought, well, I'm going to interview Professor Wolf and he's a lovely guy and he's doing some amazing stuff now. This is 40 years later, but I wanted to hear about this study. So in the book, I detail how he, how he discovered this. And it was an experiment in, I don't want to go into the details now, but it was an experiment in rats that he was able to, Essentially, after the rats had been suitably anesthetized and, in fact, had had the top part of their brains removed uh, to, to ensure that there was no discomfort. I know there's issues around animal research, but uh, they did everything they could and it complied with ethics. How does the bioethicist um, deal with that? Yeah, well, you know, what he discovered is so important. Um, yeah. you know, he really discovered that if you inflict pain on, on a rat's paw and you don't do it over and over over the course of a morning, by the afternoon, that rat will be withdrawing the paw in a, in a pain response to stroking the leg even away from the foot So, with, with a paintbrush, so not even inflicting a painful stimulus. So mm-hmm. Clifford Wolf is a very, very rigorous researcher, and, you know, you read about this, this study in the book, how he did it. It's, and that's one of the reasons why I actually detail these studies quite um in, in a quite a lengthy way yeah. it's so convincing when yeah. you see such a good study laid out but the long and the short you know, the lesson for all of us is that um if you've got chronic pain and there's no one size fits all approach we're all different but there is a fair chance especially if the initial cause was a musculoskeletal injury you know you fell over or you uh, hurt your knee or you you were lifting a box and you hurt your back there was a really strong chance that if you develop chronic pain, uh, that central sensitization is contributing to that. And that is relevant because the target for your treatment should not necessarily be the anatomical part, whether it's the knee or the back. It should be the sensitized nerve pathway and the brain changes that also accompany this that I talk about in the book. Yeah. And there's a number of therapies now, pain reprocessing therapy, which I do talk about in the book. Uh, I think you guys are pretty familiar with that uh, developed by um, Yoni Ashar and Tor, Tor Wager uh, uh, as part of a study that was published in JAMA just, just about 12 months ago. Um, and, you know, in a nutshell, what that, what that therapy does 
is it informs people about central sensitization. This was a study that looked at people who'd had uh, back pain for at least uh, 10 years, at least four out of 10 pain, and it divided them up into three groups. One group got treatment as usual, which was uh, anti-inflammatory drugs and opiate medication. One group got a placebo injection to the lower back of, of salt water, and placebo injections can be very effective. And the third group got pain reprocessing therapy, which basically followed a, a very rigorous search to look for a structural abnormality that was causing these people's back pain. And when they ruled that out, because you really need to rule out an ongoing tumour or infection or um, uh, other structural cause, potentially broken bone, causing pain before you call it sensitization. Um, those people were informed that, that they've got sensitization as a big part of their pain. Mm -hmm. And when they followed them up for, for a year, they found treatment as usual improved a little bit. Uh, the placebo injection, about 20% of those were, were pain-free or nearly pain-free after a month. But the pain reprocessing therapy group, two-thirds of them were pain-free or nearly pain-free after one month and the effect held for 12 months. I know you Torwager, Professor Torwager at Dartmouth, who was the lead investigator on that study for the, for the book. Um, you know, he gets a third of a chapter because he's such a, a legend in this field. Um, so what it's really telling you is that knowledge of this sensitization process, knowledge of central sensitization can be therapeutic in and of itself. Yes. When you understand that, you can yeah. get better, probably by what they call a safety reappraisal. The sensation comes up from the back, and equipped with this new knowledge, you can now say, ah, oh, it does hurt, but you know what? It probably doesn't indicate tissue damage because we know that when chronic pain is part of the sensitization process, chronic pain becomes a, a poorer and poorer marker of tissue damage as, for the reasons that I've talked about and is far more likely to indicate nerve pain. So, so people are reassured by this. They reappraise the pain as being something that is dangerous and indicating an ongoing injury. They reappraise it to something that's safe. And what probably happens is that there's a very important area in the brain, uh, different areas that combine to form the descending pain modulatory network, a very complicated name for different brain areas that can actually have connections that reach down to the top part of the spinal cord, the medulla, the lower part of the brain, and they can switch off pain they can actually close the gate on pain and you can yeah. see these effects very very rapidly yeah it, 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 could i just mention a that pavlov's pavlov's dog is the same scenario you know when they rang the bell and the dog would salivate so yeah. it, it's a similar you okay know, i'm going to heard of that so Rose? And with, oh, with the greatest possible respect, uh, and, and it may well be the case that um, there are some similarities, but in the pain science that, that I researched for the book, there's a pretty clear distinction now being drawn between central sensitization and conditioned pain or learned pain. But you are spot on because um, something very similar to what happens in, with Pavlov's dogs can happen with pain. And there's a researcher in South Africa, and, and she, she moved to work in Australia with Lauren Mosley, uh, the University of South Australia, and she did a PhD on whether you can learn pain. And she did a fantastic experiment, which I detail in the book. Um, and what she basically did was she got a, a little vibrating tactor, it's called, the little vibrator that you have in your phone that vibrates when you, when you get a phone call, and took that out um, and was going to use it in this experiment. The experiment also involved firing a dermatology laser, the ones that get rid of spider veins at, at a person's back. They were, these were all healthy people. I think there were about 16 of them. And uh, she'd fire it, the, the laser just at the threshold where they'd feel pain in their lower back. Um, and she paired that with a phone tack to buzzing just above that spot on, on, on their back. She taped it to the back. Um, and then she'd fire the laser just below the threshold for pain. So it didn't actually hurt. And then she, at the same time, she had another phone tactor buzzing below the area. So one above buzzing with, with pain, one below buzzing when the laser delivered no pain, when it was shot at their back. And then afterwards she tested them all and she gave them the laser just at the threshold of pain paired with either the buzzing phone tactor above or below. And what she found was that when it buzzed above, the pain was more unpleasant 
um, and overall a, a worse pain purely because of this buzzing tactic. And so what it suggests is that something that's been theorized for a long time, that we can learn to be in pain by linking through an automatic association a pain cue with pain. And how would it work in real, in real life? Well, let's say you're at work and there's a specific room at work where your job is to pick up boxes. Say you're a store person um, and you go in and pick up a box and, and you give yourself a, a back injury, a sore back. What can happen, and this is um, the work of Vanya Apkarian at Northwestern University, who I also interviewed for the book, you can learn to link the movement with pain. So the next time you go to bend over and pick something up, you can get pain before you even bend over. It's well recognised. Yeah. Um, and you can link, so that's a pain cue, or you can link a place cue. You can go into that room and it can actually lower your threshold for developing pain. And at that's, how, that's, how, that's how the brain gets trained. We call it conditional response. But it's amazing, this brain, how we, we're training it to do that. And so in honor of just the people are listening and we can untrain it, unlearn it, which is the name of Dr. Schrubiner's book, Unlearn Your Pain. So you're saying that exact thing. And just in, in honor of the doctors, when I don't want everyone to bash doctors. Doctors don't know this, but they know they know about it. But they, they, if they knew this, they would be treating pain differently. And so I think that is, that is so important. Absolutely right, Tova, that when you when you go to doctors, you know, we, I was a doctor, as you know, we can be kind of demonized. Oh, you know, the doctors, they prescribe drugs and they just want everyone to have surgery. And I'll tell you a story. A friend of mine's a law lecturer at a university. And uh, about a month ago, uh, she sent me a text saying that one of her young male law students had torn his anterior cruciate ligament in his knee and he went to see a surgeon. Now, a lot of surgeons will do surgery on that. There is a move now to, to potentially treat uh, that non-surgically through physiotherapy and other modalities. And this surgeon, uh, who also happened to be a male, um, said, look, I'm not going to operate, uh, educated him and said, I'd like you to read this book. And he prescribed in my book. Now, she, she, she messaged me because it was such a great thing. And what I think that that story illustrates is that you know, I work with doctors for 20 years. They have got their patient's best interests at heart. Every doctor I know wants the best for their patient. With chronic pain, you know, this is why you guys are, are so important because, you know, you, you fill, fill that gap. Um, with chronic pain, it's really hard for doctors to manage that as well as do surgeries or if you're a GP as well as do all this other stuff you do in general practice. I was talking to a mate of mine who's a general surgeon. They don't have time to educate their patients about chronic pain, so they're looking for resources. And, look, I'm not saying my book's the be-all and end-all, but, you know, it is written with a science journalism um, oh, focus in okay. mind. and uh, okay, the Paul, it's excellent. That. I uh, recommend it to, I mean, I, Tova and I have recommended it already since I read it to any patients that come across our, us because it gives a clear, clear, and all that research, <laughs> you've actually <laughs> named it. But not only have you named it, you've told us about the people behind the scenes who've created this. And that's what makes it a calming effect for patients because usually there's no calmness. They're reading a book to get information, yes? Yeah. Whereas when they're reading your book, they've got to breathe. Yeah. So, I mean, that was the aim of the book. I mean, I've had some comments saying, oh, what are all these stories about? Just give us the info. <laughs> um, you know, negative attention is also good good PR. Yeah, I take it all. I take. I look at it all really closely, and and I, I try and be as even handed as I can. And you know, I think that that was a valid criticism because some people will go to these books and they want a recipe format for how to get better. They don't want to read other people's stories. But what I discovered in researching the book was that a lot of people with pain do want to hear other people's stories, and. There's, there's, a, there's a reason for that. And, you know, I'll use Lauren, who was in, who was in the book, um, I think in the second chapter, who, you know, she was a champion triathlete and a, and a police uh, prosecutor in Tasmania. And she was riding her road bike, training for the Melbourne Ironman. Mm. She was hit by a truck. Now, when I read her story, you know, I pretty much dictated a lot of this from what she told me 
verbatim because I don't, I don't know what's going to be important. It was her experience. So I'll go back and read it. And she'll talk about how sometimes she will breathe out and visualize the word pain. And that was part of her mindfulness approach to, to reducing pain. And we know that mindfulness can be beneficial. And we know you guys are aware of this and probably your, your audience as well, our audience, but uh, opti- adopting a detached, uh, non judgmental attitude to sensations and, you know, that can reduce the, the urgency of, of the pain. Um, but, you know, I'll come back to that. I'll go, oh, yeah, Lauren did this. I might try that myself. So I, I learn stuff from these stories um, all the time. And, you know, it goes back to that, that adage that the stories are equipment for living and we don't know what people are going to take away from them. So, you know, there are stories in my book of, of about six or seven people with chronic pain themselves. And then there are the stories of a couple of dozen researchers, their, their lives to some, their some degree as well. yeah. and, and their, and their pain. Um, so, and, and their research, I, sh- I should say. Um, but I did want to, and, and just cut me off if you need to, I did want to just go back to this idea of learned pain, because I think you guys were really connecting with that. But Vanya Akarian, who did a lot of this research in, in Northwestern, what he found was that when he did a study on people with new onset back pain, that was pain lasting about four months, he put them all in a brain scanner that could measure which parts of their brain were lighting up. And at the start of this, everyone's brains were lighting up in the sensory cortex. What's that? Well, that's the part of the brain that registers any sensation. If I press on my hand now, it'll register that. It also registers pain. It made perfect sense. And he followed these people, though, for, for 12 months. And about half of them got better in that time. And as you'd expect, that those brain changes just disappeared um, when they came back for their scans. But the other half developed chronic pain. and their brain changes persisted, but something weird happened. They were no longer in the sensory cortex, that classic area that measures sensations, the things that you physic, the physical sensations that you're feeling. They'd moved to the emotional parts of the brain. They'd moved to the amygdala, which registers fear. They'd moved to the hippocampus, which registers sadness and depression. And they'd moved to another area of the brain um, called the nucleus accumbens and the medial prefrontal cortex, which, which is part of the reward pathway. Wow. Um, that measures the reward you get from eating chocolate or, or having a good day at work, or indeed the reward from an unhealthy addiction like gambling, drugs, or alcohol. Wow. So, so what we learned from this was what's happening, just going back to the um, anxiety and sadness changes, Apkarian thinks, and there's some pretty robust evidence behind this now, in chronic pain, of course you're going to feel anxious and sad as a consequence of the pain. It makes you feel bloody miserable. But those negative emotions can actually perpetuate pain in and of themselves. Why? Because they act as a filter of mindset that places a tag with the name threat on any sensation that's coming from a body part. So for me, um, coming from my knee, I felt really down about it. I felt anxious, miserable about it. So when I get a sensation from the knee, those negative emotions were saying, oh, that's, that's a threat because that's what negative emotions do. They actually pass the world into things that, that are bad for us. Oh, that makes you feel bad. Avoid that. That's a threat. So these negative emotions are, are causing a threat tag to be placed on uh, these sensations. And this is one of the things about pain reprocessing therapy. I've never talked about it. But, you know, they want you to undergo a safety reappraisal. Go back to that idea that it's not threatening. Those negative emotions are perpetuating this. But let's see if we can wind back that that negative appraisal and hopefully the negative emotions that go with it. And one last thing, I know I'm going on a bit, why would the reward system be involved in pain? Why? Pain is not rewarding. But I'll tell you, what is rewarding if you've got chronic pain? Not having any pain. Yes, so the protection. Reward of no pain goes sky high. And because of that, people with chronic pain can be constantly searching. For me, it was a knee. Oh, is that pain? Is it coming back? Um, and, you know, paradoxically, the reward of no pain makes you looking out for it all the time and it ramps up the threat value. So your new addiction, your new addiction. 
Well, you're almost addicted to, to being pain-free and it's got such a reward value that when you get any sensation that could be interpreted as painful, it becomes a threat uh, to that reward. And again, the pain's real, really hurts, it's 100% real, but the lessons from central, central sensitization, the lessons from learned pain through classical conditioning, the Pavlov's uh, connection uh, that Rose alluded to, and persistent pain from these brain changes that shift the area of the brain registering pain to the emotional regions, all of those things conspire to tell us that chronic pain is a less accurate marker of damage to the tissues. And in many cases, it's more likely to be a sensitized nerve system, uh, nervous system and those, those brain changes, which, which radically alters the kinds of treatments that we really should be considering for that pain. You know, when I read your book, I thought, I wonder, is it oxytocin? What is it that the body produces to, to watch out for the fear? What, what, what is it? Well, we can do a number of things um, to, to get rid of that fear, mm. um, which may be related to um, flight and, and fright responses, the sympathetic nervous system, which pumps out adrenaline and noradrenaline that gets a heart racing, um, gets a sweating, feeling maybe sometimes panicky. Our brain actually senses all those, those changes. Often those changes happen before our feelings change. This is a guy called Antonio Damasio's uh, somatic marker hypothesis. Uh, I don't know if anyone has read uh, Descartes' error from quite a few years ago. But those changes will happen and they'll trigger those um, sympathetic uh, nervous system changes, adrenaline, noradrenaline, and we'll start to feel anxious. And, and that causes you know, more of, Then you kick in thing. with something to drop the anxiety, don't you? Well, we know that areas like the amygdala, which is the body's alarm system that is responsible for causing release of those hormones from the adrenal gland. <laughs> uh, we can actually, it's very responsive to, to thoughts. So our prefrontal cortex, which is the, uh, the kind of home base for all our thinking, has got very <laughs> amygdala. So if you can do something that reinforces that sensations coming from a previously injured and painful part are no longer a threat, that can actually cause the amygdala to damp down uh, its stimuli to the rest of the body to, to um, pump out these uh, stress hormones. Um, and, you know, one of the big ones is graded exercise. So this is why when you're doing graded exercise, which in plain language means doing exercise that starts low and slow, for me, as I mentioned earlier, it was riding a bike in the garage on a stationary trainer for 30 seconds. And I'm someone that was riding 100 kilometres. I didn't, did a 220-kilometre ride around the bay in Melbourne. I that rode gives you endorphins then, doesn't it? Sorry. It kicks in your yeah. endorphins, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. The thing we're trying to do with this is to do a small trial, 30 seconds, that is so small of rolling your legs over that it shouldn't give you any pain. And it didn't. I waited two days and then I did 60 seconds. And I gradually increased it by a minute or two minutes every couple of days until I was riding for you know 20 minutes in the garage and I eventually got back on the bike. I didn't start racing again, but I could ride much further. And look, you mentioned endorphins and, and that's a really good point, Rose, because what I've just talked about, that graded exercise, one of the reasons that it can wind back pain is because it can cause you to unlearn that conditioned pain that we still talked about before, the, the kind of Pavlovian conditioning. Mm. But the other thing that can happen, well, there's plenty of other things, but one of them is that when you exercise, you release, release endorphins. That can damp down pain. Uh, you also release serotonin, uh, the happy brain chemical. That but can you're also down in a position to say this pain, this sensation, like Alan Gordon will say, you know, sensations, we have them all the time, especially if we've had an old injury. But if we add fear to it, it will turn to pain. So you're now yeah. saying, even if we had a sensation, there's nothing to be scared of. It's just the, nor you know, sensations. I'm looking for it. I'm going to find it if I look for it. Let me just be in this neutral place and know that I can ride a bike, move my body, feel a sensation, and there's no threat. So let's yeah. sort of give it a bigger umbrella <laughs> that we don't have to, we're, you know, we're going to, like you said in the beginning of the, of the, of the broadcast, we're going to look for sensations. We're going to find them. They're, you know, 
they're there. Yeah. Look, I think I think Alan Gordon's, you know, I think he's absolutely right there. And you know, one of the things in pain reprocessing therapy is mindfulness. And we know through cognitive behavior therapy, a lot of um, uh, which is it, pain reprocessing therapy draws on, uh, we know um, that um, if you uh, have a, a, an event that happens, uh, it's called an activating event, you can then develop these negative automatic thoughts. They happen automatically. I get a sensation from my knee. The automatic response is to think, oh, no, the injury's back. I've got to stop moving it. What mindfulness suggests is, well, okay, I've been trained by someone like Alan Gordon or, or, or another psychotherapist to just stand back uh, mentally and just watch that sensation. Don't engage with it. Um, do all, the, all of those mindful things. Be non judgmental in, in your watching. Be friends with um, it. Just friend so that, it. Don't automatically uh, interpret that as a negative yeah. uh, thought that this this is indicative that the, yeah. my knee is really yeah. damaged. So that's part oh, of it. Oh, I have a big question, but Rose, did you did you want to comment? Because I've been asking. No, a lot no, of no, what, what I was thinking as Paul was talking, I I'd, I'd love him if he's got the energy to just run through some of these chapters because the word and the chapters is so appropriate. The rabbit hole of who you are, correcting the brain's image of the body. He's he's been yes. very insightful in how he's put this together and that's what yeah. you know that's why one of the reasons why we um we recommend this book because it allows patients to actually see that it's their thoughts that are, are causing the pain not the pain an old rusty robot how new beliefs can unwire your brain Please. yeah and look really, up is the book so on Audibles, on Kindle and Audibles as well, Paul? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Let, let me just put in a, a word of caution there. Um, it's really important that anyone with chronic pain um, sees a trusted health practitioner to ensure that they don't have a structural problem causing the pain, You know, whether it be a collection of, of pus from an infection, whether it be a, a stress fracture in a foot, um, whether it be a, a vertebral compression fracture, fracture whether it, you know, okay, in some but, cases yeah. it may be, um, something more serious. But I want to argue that point. <laughs> but if it's over 10 weeks, you said that yourself, it's not causing. I mean, we're talking about people that pain heals, the body heals, people heal from disease. Let's look at sure. the other end of this, which may not be so scientific, but the body can heal. I'm meeting people healing from cancer, from MS. I'm just saying the body has the ability to heal. And even yep. your work can can take a big part of that, and somebody can live with the disease and on a higher level. We're not even talking about quantum physics, and lots of neuroscientists are talking about quantum physics, and I'm not going to go there today. But we're talking about the body can heal, and Rose and I, I mean, like the body can heal from everything. So I want people to feel hopeful and and believe in their ability. That if they got sick, they can get well. They can unlearn anxiety. They can unlearn pain. So if you can take this conversation a tiny bit to, to the other side of the arena, okay, surely get structural. But then surgery can help. Medicine can help. Why Rose taught me this term, medically unexplained symptoms. Why aren't people, why are these symptoms not getting helped? Yeah, look, and I support that 100%. It's just, it's just a reinforcing rule out the structural problem because if you've got a broken bone and it needs to be set, that needs to be set. Of that's course. Gonna, of probably course. Gonna fix that. So well, most, most of do that. Patients... So I, I stress that the central sensitization, it's, it's what's called the diagnosis of exclusion. So you rule out something that is clearly amenable to an intervention. Um, the other thing is that you can, you can do something called quantitative sensory testing. So there's now positive tests that you can do to rule in central sensitization, but they're actually quite hard to access. So through a you mean questionnaire. To see that you have this, this uh, exaggerated re reaction to pain called people can actually test for that? You can test for that. So you can do a questionnaire, questionnaire that characterizes the nature of the pain. Oh, yeah, we have that question. Yeah, yeah. Quantitative sensory testing, which involves sticking little uh, bits of nylon into a person and checking for, for spreading pain around an area and so on. And you can do brain scans as well and see which parts of the brain are lighting up. But they're, they're very cost, costly and labour-intensive and they okay. cannot happen in, in the average. Rose, so, you were going to no, say no, something, no. Rose? But going back to your point about the old rusty robot, 
um, and rewiring the brain and, and how the brain sees the body. I mean, that, that chapter really leads into this whole idea that's been drawn from phantom limb syndrome. And when people have a limb amputated and feel phantom limb, that is 100% real pain. It can oh, be excruciating, the worst thing people have ever experienced. And they feel it in the missing limb. And one of the, the theories about that is that the pain is being generated by the brain holding on to a disfigured, injured version of the missing body part. And so um, you've probably heard of uh, Ramachandran, the neurologist and, and mirror therapy. So one of the, the treatments that you can do, for example, who's missing an, an upper limb, is you can have them put the healthy hand down on the table in front of them and where the missing hand would be put a vertical mirror reflecting the healthy hand. They look into it and they see the healthy hand reflected on the side where the, where the hand has actually been amputated and it can actually benefit their pain. So what's happening in, um, in pain science now, and, and you know, I learned a lot of this through uh, Dr. Dan Harvey, uh, who's a physiotherapist and researcher in Queensland and who I interviewed for the book, is we're using virtual reality now to, um, as with a kind CR, of- With CRPS, um, they're using that with CRPS. Yeah, sure, and you, you will have heard of that. Um, the, the, the studies are at a very early stage. I think when I researched the book, um, uh, there's really only a couple of case studies, no randomized trials. Um, but, you know, it's really promising. And, and, and of course, uh, Tyrone Cole, who I interviewed for the book, who had terrible back pain uh, as a patient, um, used virtual reality to significantly improve his pain uh, mm. after a, a really nasty accident where he fell into a boat trailer. So, so I appreciate you pointing to those, those chapter headings, um, Rose, uh, and, and that certainly speaks to... to the old rusty robot one, because he felt like Ooh. he was an old robot. But when he, when he went into virtual reality, uh, as in, in uh, I think it was Rise to Glory, as Adonis Creed, the kind of uh, latter day version of, of Rocky, uh, he was a martial arts um, champion. Uh, the guy yeah. I interviewed Tyrone, uh, he could actually start moving and punching again in virtual reality when he couldn't do that in real life. And he in said, real it was like life, a yeah. Robot That's why. It's so you see why why I was enamored with your book. <laughs> so what Paul so I'm sorry Rose did you want to continue with that topic? Uh, well, uh not not really. I what I I suppose what I want to sort of say is that this story about how it's happening is so important. And you know just uh, as an aside also, you know you say about telling patients to go to the doctor and have a, an assessment which is true. But the thing is that they go to 20 doctors mm. instead of yeah. the one doctor. Yeah, we need a system. And I think we need to assist doctors in managing chronic pain. So if the doctor has done all the right things and ruled out a structural cause for chronic pain, um, worked out which part of the body it's emanating from, you know, even if there is ongoing inflammation or, or something that's contributing to it, then there's still a role. will cause ongoing inflammation, but it's not the disc that's causing the ongoing inflammation. It's the muscles, it's the brain. You know, Dr. Hanscom, who's one of our colleagues, studied that, you know, when we have an anxious thought, it will start that fight and flight system, probably through central sensis sensitization and begin this process of anxiety, inflammation, and all of a sudden, oh, it's the disc. Because more and more doctors are saying it's the disc and it's not the disc. Yeah. Look, I, I did an article last year for, for Cosmos on the science of social isolation. I interviewed a guy at UCLA called Steve Cole, and he is a pioneer in the field of psychoneuroimmunology. And basically that is telling you how your thoughts and your behaviours change the release of brain chemicals and alter your immune responses. And so the upshot of that article was that when we're socially isolated, we become stressed, we turn on our sympathetic nervous system, pump out adrenaline and noradrenaline. Our white cells have got receptors for noradrenaline on them. And when you're stressed, uh, you turn off the interferon response, which is the antiviral uh, wow. response. So yes. one of the problems with socially isolating while on a macro level in COVID, you know, you're clearly preventing transmission of the disease. The other downside is that you're actually turning off antiviral immunity. So when people emerge, it's not just the fact that they haven't been exposed to, to the virus. Um, you know, there's an evolutionary reason why we turn off antiviral immunity when we're alone. And that's because we're, we're meant to actually be in the tribe. 
uh, fighting off uh, antivirus, uh, fighting off viruses. But the other thing that happens when you're separated from your tribal group is that you turn on inflammation um, and yeah. you can develop chronic inflammation. So Steve Cole's been researching this for 30 years and it's pretty, pretty ro robust. Um, so yeah, you're, look, I couldn't agree with you more that there is a very robust scientifically defensible uh, mind body connection, if you like, um, that is intimately related to our immune responses to environmental uh, stimuli and antigens. And if I could use an example of people with herpes, cold sores, and they become stressed. Sure, sure. It's like the virus is in our system anyway. Yeah. The, so, the so, stress so, thing, <clears throat> the, the protective um, layer is gone with the stress. Yeah, I haven't researched that specifically, mm -hmm. but it certainly seems plausible that... Um, well, autoimmune, autoimmune responses. And I, I want to, in honour of my, my professional partner, Rose Hoy, who we started this show right during COVID, thinking people were going to need, they're going to need insights and they're going to need help and assistance that their body is not attacking them, that they can get through COVID and they can understand this. You know, it, it, it went, it may, you know, it went, it went, it went, it went uh, many different directions, the COVID. And that's when Rose and I started, but I want to honor my professional partner because, because of her work with ISTDP, ISTDP, uh, <laughs> intensive short-term dynamic psychotherapy invented by Dr. Davenu and then um, educated by Dr. Alan Abyss, who wrote a book with Dr. Howard Trubiner, you know, when also which people get this, which people will get chronic pain are the kind of people that have childhood traumas or adverse childhood experiences. And then it becomes a bigger cycle where that was not your, your situation, Paul. And we're not here to, to divulge, divulge your childhood and why you, you know, got knee pain. But it can, it can, and then people can heal from that place. Whether yeah. the doctor said disc herniation, not people can heal from that place of understanding the trauma and how it set their brain. Like, like the man with the phantom leg got his leg cut off. He has a trauma from needing his, to get his leg cut off. So Rose, can you comment for a moment about, because like it's each show, it's nice to talk and give people hope about that they're not their trauma, that they can um, move through this and integrate their trauma. Yes, well, that's why Paul's book puts it all out there. Each chapter is a chapter with the next level, the next level, the next level. And, of course, I like Chapter 7 because Chapter 7 goes on to, uh, what was that guy's name? Whistler or something. And Greg how he, be he became grumpy and miserable and his family left him. Whistler, I think that's his name, something yep. like that. Yeah. Yep. And then you describe what Ella, whatever the I can't think of the researcher's name. He's he's Iranian. Barney Rapkarian. Yes. Yeah. You describe yeah. how his research is giving us a whole lot of insight into yeah. um into I, how, I think that you've, both, you've raised a really important point there about childhood and um you know, a couple of things to say about that. Um, obviously, stressful uh, circumstances that happen in life, um, as you know, um, they can amp up that negative, uh, anxious and, and sad or depressed response to sensations that we're feeling as yeah. pain. Um, so that's clearly a part of it. But in terms of going back to childhood, I mean, one of the interesting lessons that I learned from the book was from Lauren again in chapter, just going back to chapter two, um, was her childhood experience uh, was of having absent parents. Now, she knew her parents loved her 100%, but they were really busy. They were working a lot. And so yeah. she really felt uh, the absence of her parents. And, you know, her, her, we can't really prove this, but one interpretation is that that drove her to succeed, to try and get parental approval. Yeah. And what it shifted her goals. So her goals became kind of peculiar. She wanted to do the Melbourne Ironman. Um, and this is the thing. When you've got very, very high-level goals uh, and you are, you know, taking no prisons about achieving those goals, pain becomes a threat to those goals. So one of the reasons why, um, you know, 
basically our, our persona, our childhood experiences, our psychology are very intimately connected with whether we're going to get pain or not, is the nature of our goals. And if we really hold on to a, a goal as being something that's absolutely uh, central to our self-esteem and something that we're truly aspirational for, and pain threatens that, that is going to reinforce that whole mechanism whereby pain becomes a threat. And yeah. as soon as it's a threat, that reinforces those negative emotions, which may also be there from stressful experiences in life, but it can reinforce those negative emotions. Those negative emotions are then more likely um, to morph sensations that, that perhaps ought not to be painful. For, for me, it was a breeze blowing on my knee, as I mentioned when I rode my bike. Yeah. Morph and shift them into painful ones. Again, it really hurts. It's 100% pain, but in that setting, it may not be indicative of underlying tissue damage. Wow. <laughs> How are you feeling, Dr. Paul? Okay. 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 <laughs> Good. So, so I would like to go ahead, Rose. Do you have a question? What was that, Tova? Do you have a question, Rose? No, no. I, I just, I'm just so pleased that you've come on and yeah. talked about these things because it's so important. And, you know, if one person watches this and has self-reflection, we've helped one other human being to live a happy life. Yeah. I mean, that, that's our goal, isn't it? Yeah. To help, to, and, yeah. And, and look, on that, I, I would say, you know, there's, a few, there's, there's really three important things about this book. One is knowledge of central sensitization. You know, knowledge about those sensitized nerve pathways and that how that can actually heal pain, at least to some degree, you know, of itself. We know this through pain reprocessing therapy. But, you know, we mentioned I'm a bioethicist. I think there's an ethical issue here too. And, and that is, you know, if you're, if you're signing up for surgery and the primary aim of that surgery is to relieve pain from a part that is going to be operated on, <clears throat> that surgery might, might be entirely appropriate. Um, and there'd be a good physiological basis for that. But I think it's really important that there, there has to be a discussion about central sensitization. How yeah. much of this pain is coming from the anatomical part? How much is coming from the sensitized nerves? Because maybe we should actually work on the nerves first um, before we have the knee replacement, for example, and see how we go. Um, and as I detail in the book, there's, there's a whole bunch of, of other reasons why exercise can actually improve things like osteoarthritis. Yeah. But the final thing I'd probably say is that I think that these, and perhaps it's a cliche, but I think these understandings and particularly this idea of central sensitization it can give people hope. Um, you know, Greg Whistler, who, who you mentioned, I mean, when he heard about this, that maybe all this pain that he'd had for 30 years in his back after, after playing football as a kid, American football, maybe it didn't mean that his back was stuffed, that his back was... <laughs> You know, beyond repair, maybe it was sensitization. And the kind of the proof for that is people, the people that were getting better in that study, the pain reprocessing study, those people, um, those people had a reduction in something called kinesiophobia. They, that's the fear of movement. So they were yeah. less to wow. move. And exercise. Yeah. That's an and important, <laughs> actually, that's a very important um uh, in some, you know, give, it gives people hope that, that they can actually grasp this information yeah. and utilize it under the care of the, an appropriate practitioner to advance the ends of, of winding back chronic pain. Yeah. Kinesio, kinesio phobia. phobia. Wow. I mean, fear I, of movement. I, yeah, of course. Or, or, you know, but, 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 duh, I go and I play football and I have pain. And I say to my patients, go back to the football field. And they're like, doc, you're crazy. I'm like, no, please. But what you're saying is different, Expo graded exposure, which is better. Yeah. Oh, because if they go once a week, they're going to have pain. They got to go every day, a little bit every day. Got to start really, really low and slow. Um, and, you know, exercise works, as we mentioned, endorphins, our bodies, you know, opioids, serotonin. Um, really release the serotonin. It can wind back the learned component of pain. But in things like osteoarthritis, um, exercise has been shown. Kath, Kathleen Sluka, who I interviewed for the book, proved this beautifully in some beautiful studies in, in, in uh, rodents. Um, when you chronically exercise, 
and then you go out for a long run, um, there's a, an immune cell in your skeletal muscle, let's say in your thigh muscle, um, that if you're just a couch potato, you don't move at all. When you exercise, they're going to pump out inflammatory proteins that cause inflammation. <laughs> in mice that chronically exercised, those macrophages, they're called, those immune cells, underwent a kind of uh, hide to Jekyll personality shift. The very same cells changed such that in mice that were exercising a lot, when they then went and did another bout of exercise, um, in fact, after they were given an injection to try and induce pain, they didn't get any pain. And why? Because those immune cells had switched and they now produced anti-inflammatory proteins when they exercise. So that's another reason why exercise can be an anti-pain um, treatment. We know that it, pro it, it produces proteoglycans, the things that pump up the cartilage that line, line your joints. Um, that's another thing. And it can also alter when you strengthen muscles, the way you land, for example, on a knee and landing differently on a knee can probably cause less of those sensations that our brain then misinterprets as pain. Again, real pain, hundred percent real, but the brain's going, Oh, I feel all these different sensations, bang, 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 because I'm landing on a straight knee. This is the work of Christian Barton who I interview in the book. Um, that can be reduced in the setting of uh, strengthening um, muscles around a particular joint. So, so multifactorial approach yeah. uh, by which exercise can ameliorate pain. Yeah, it's amazing. So thank you over and over again. Uh, and, oh, I wanted to ask a little question. How long did this book take? Because it germinated as I read yeah. it. It's a germinating thing I saw. It's about a bit over 18 months, about 20 months to write it. Wow. Um, so, yeah, it was a, a labour of love and it was mm. just a fascinating I where people, I mean, Where do people get time to write a book? I, don't, I have no idea how people get time to write a book. But obviously you have this expression, this need to express, and you put it on paper and it became a book. Yeah. Well, you know, I worked full time on it and, you know, I set aside my other science journalism oh, activities. Did you? Oh, okay. Um, okay. And just worked full time on the book. And it was just so rewarding because, you know, the process of writing, yes, the process of interviewing these amazing people, the people with pain, the researchers, it was just a masterclass from both of them that I got to spend an hour or two hours with them. Yeah. I learned so much. And, Absolutely. you know, the process of trying to tell their stories as colourfully as I could by, you know, where, where did all these things happen and try to bring out the pictures of where these, where these uh, amazing things actually happened. To, to help the reader, you know, not be listening to scientific studies all the time, but thinking, oh, that's yeah, right. he came from that country and, and went to this country and, and uh, worked yes. with so and so. And, and did, that's an interesting. Did you go to the, like, did you go to that, whatever it, whatever that place was? Where, uh, I, I did, I did one whatever. In person interview. This was during the lockdown. So I did one in person interview for the whole book and everything else was, had to be on Zoom. <laughs> we were locked down. Um, so, <laughs> You know, the internet has a bunch of, of uh, resources now that you can use to describe places. You know, you Google Earth, um, Google Street View, uh, mm. and I would have images sent to me from, from my interviewees so I could, I could actually um, find out where they yeah. so If you actually looked at the acknowledgements um, and a shout out to the people at the Cleveland Heights Historical Society, I spent a long time and I was aided greatly by a, a few people there to find out where Robert Nershall um, used his camera to film Stan Smith to, to work out what was caused, Stan Smith, the famous Wimbledon, Wimbledon champion tennis player, oh, um, yeah. to work out what was causing tennis, tennis elbow. Um, and I wanted to find out where that tennis court was. So I contacted the Cleveland Heights Historical Society and they put out the word and finally they sent me these beautiful black and white photographs. Wow. And we were able to say, ah, oh, on Google Earth, there's Roxburgh uh, Middle School. Like the chimney's still there, and it was a temporary Davis Cup tennis court set up for, for the matches. I think between the US and Germany, um, just outside the car park of that school. It was all temporary, so it's not there now. So you can't. So yeah. just little processes like that, hunting down these places, was was really yeah. rewarding. And so you know, I'm so grateful to you. To enjoy you enjoyed writing your book. You enjoyed. Oh yeah. Loved it. Yeah. I love it. Well, you That's see, for, from a, if I could just put a plug in there, 
to patients that would be reading the book. Can you hold the book what, again up, Bruce? Hold okay. The book up. What what um what we're looking at is that rest and digest thing. As you're reading the book, as he's talking about the, the football oval or whatever, he's actually allowing you as a reader to to drop because there's this great urge in patients to find out every single thing that they could possibly know about this stuff. You've given them that, but you've also given them a prelude so that they can calm themselves as they're reading it. So thank you again. It's been a real pleasure to be on, on the show, Rose and Tova. Thank you for having and me. We will have sequel too, because there's more to talk, there's more chapters to talk about. And and thank you so much for joining us, especially today. And so, Rose, have a wonderful day. Dr. Paul, feel well to you and your family. And we'll be back next week. This is TMS Roundtable Global. Thank you so much. Bless you all out there who've been listening today. Okay. We're going to go off. I just have to do one thing.